Hello, everyone. Some of my mechanical friends are trying to get back to Gecko's garage today. So I think we should go and pick them up on this amazing Arriva bus. Buses are fantastic vehicles. They carry lots of passengers around town and take people to places they need to go. Buses have lots of space inside to fit as many people on as possible. What shape is this bus? Yes, it's a rectangle. Look how many seats are in here. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 22 23 24 25 26 27 28 seats wow and when the seats are full there's even places for people to stand look you can hold on to these handrails and these grab handles too, to make sure you don't fall over when the bus stops. This is Mary, and she's the driver of this bus. Mary's just going round the bus to do all of her safety checks before going out on the road. What shape are the wheels on the bus? Yes, they're a circle. This bus is special because it runs on electricity. That means it doesn't have to be filled with petrol or diesel. But instead, it can be plugged in and charged. It's got a big battery that stores all of the electricity up on the roof. Hi Gecko, do you want to come and see where I drive my bus? Yes, please. Mary sits in a place called the cab and to get into the driving seat, she opens this door and climbs inside. Mary can then press this button to open and close the electric doors. There's lots of other buttons and controls for Mary to press in here too. To start the bus, Mary presses this button. I think it's time we went and picked up the mechanicals. Mary, can I buy a ticket, please? To buy a ticket, passengers give the correct money to the driver and she prints them a ticket. Mary can change the sign on the front to tell people where the bus is going. Hooray! We're off to my garage. Don't worry, mechanicals. We're coming for you. On the bus go flash, 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 flash. The lights on the bus go flash, 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 all day long. The tickets on the bus go print, 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 print. The tickets on the bus go print, 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 all day long. The wipers on the bus go swish, swish, swish. Swish, 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 swish. The wipers on the bus go swish, swish, swish all day long. Oh, hey there. The horn on the bus goes beep, 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 beep. The horn on the bus goes beep, beep, beep all day long. Oh ho! The doors on the bus go open and close, open and close, open and close. The doors on the bus go open and close all day long. Hello, Red Mechanical. I hope we didn't keep you waiting there too long. Come on board, take a seat. The thing I love best about travelling around on a bus is looking out of the big windows and spotting things. There's lots of different shaped road signs around. 
This one is square. This one is a circle. And this one is a triangle. This one's very important because it tells vehicles to slow down because there might be children around. Hello, Blue Mechanical. We've had to stop at a traffic light because it's on red. There's three different traffic light colours. Red, amber and green. The red light means stop. The amber light means the signal is about to change. And green means go, go, go. This bus is very smooth and very quiet because it runs on electricity. That means it's even better for the environment than other buses. It's Green Mechanical. Hello. Right, I think that's everyone now. Let's head back to the garage. Can you remember all of the shapes we've learned today? Rectangle. Circle. Square. And triangle. Thanks very much to Mary and all the team at Ariba for taking us on this amazing bus journey today. What do you say, Mechanicals? That's thank you. We'll see you again soon. Bye! Hello everyone! Gecko here. I'm at Walk Mill in Cheshire to learn all about Combine Harvesters. Combine Harvesters are one of the most important vehicles used on farms. Loads of the food we eat comes from plants that are grown in fields. All of this wheat needs to be harvested, so it's a good job we've got this incredible combine harvester. This combine harvester is called Daisy. She's got lots of neat parts that make her so useful on the farm. Let's take a look. Just look at these massive caterpillar tracks. They're designed to move the combine harvester through the field, even when the ground is very wet and muddy. They're like welly boots for wheels. The front of the combine harvester is made up of different parts which pull the wheat inside. Very sharp blades called teeth act like scissors and cut the wheat at the bottom. I wonder why they're called teeth. <laughs> Do you eat your food like that? When the vehicle is full to the brim with wheat, a tractor with a trailer on the back drives next to the combine. The grain is carried up from the tank and fired out of a side pipe into the trailer. This is Ben and he's a farmer. His job is to drive and operate the combine harvester. And driving the tractor is Heather. She's also a farmer. And look, there's her sheepdog, Gary. Hey, hey, hey boy. Ben and Heather use their radios to talk to each other to make sure the vehicles are in the right place so the trailer can catch all of the falling grain. Look at them all working together. Teamwork makes the dream work. Hi Heather, can you please tell us a bit more about the different parts of the wheat? So this is the plant that we've been harvesting. As you can see, it grows in the soil at the bottom. Then we have the straw, which we use to bed animals down. And at the top, we have the head of the plant, which has the grain in it. We use the grain to make bread and cakes and biscuits. 
because combine harvesters are so wide and bulky, they're too big to travel on most roads, especially the small country roads around these fields. To get from one field to another, Ben and his team need to take the front off the combine and put it on a trailer. Now that we've seen the amazing combine harvester harvesting the wheat, let's head to the mill to see what happens with the wheat grains next. Here we are at Walk Mill, which is a flour mill. In here, they grind the wheat grain to make flour, which is then used to bake bread and make lots of other delicious foods like cakes. Check out this mega water wheel. The river pushes against the water wheel, making it spin, which turns the gears inside. Terrific! These gears then spin these special stones so that they can crush the grain into tiny pieces until they become flour. And this is the end result. Beautiful cakes. And bread. Can I, uh, can I please have one now? They smell delicious. Thanks to Heather, Ben and everyone at Walk Mill for showing us their incredible combine harvester. Until next time, it's Cheerio from Gecko. Bye! Hello everyone! Gecko here! I'm here at the Tarmac Quarry to meet an amazing freight train. Behind me is the locomotive. This is the part of the train that has the engine inside it and it's where the driver sits. And these are the wagons. Wow! There's loads of them. Look, the locomotive is being connected to that long, long chain of wagons. These parts are called buffers. Buffers slow down the locomotive and the wagons at the last second and stop them crashing into each other. These big hooks are connected to each other. This is called coupling. These pipes connect the air brakes from the locomotive to the wagons. That's so the train can stop. Blue Mechanical, what are you doing in that wagon? Well, okay, I suppose you can't cause any damage in there. Please just stay out of trouble whilst I go and learn how you drive a freight train. This is Matt and he's operations manager here. Let's go and have a sneak peek inside the driver's cab. So Matt, how do you drive a freight train? Right Gecko, thanks for asking. Very, very simply, we have a power throttle here, that makes us go faster. And if we want to stop, we have some braking systems. We have two. One, if we're only a locomotive by ourselves, and the other one if we've got wagons attached. If it goes really wrong, we hit the red button, and this stops us immediately. And for any naughty people we see on the track, we sound our horn to let them know we're coming. This freight train works really hard, taking special stone all over the country. This stone is used to build houses, roads, and even schools. First, the stone has to be blasted from the ground. Big trucks like excavators and dump trucks work together to move this stone around. The stone is then crushed to make all of the pieces much smaller. But how do they get this stone from the quarry all the way over to the train's wagons? Well, inside these tunnels are amazing things called conveyor belts. They're a bit like magic moving carpets. 
they carry the stone all the way up and across to where the train's parked. And the conveyor belt finishes here, just above the wagons. The stone falls out of a chute into the empty wagons. Amazing! When each wagon is full, the driver drives the train forwards, ready for the next empty wagon to be loaded up. And that's it! The wagons are all full, so it's time for the train to start its journey. Oh no! I totally forgot! Blue Mechanical's still in one of the wagons! Sit tight, Blue! We'll catch up with you at the next tarmac depot! The train will now travel through this beautiful countryside for two hours before it arrives in the city ready to be unloaded and turned into special building material. Freight trains are amazing because they can carry so much stuff. Over 30 houses could be built from all of the stone carried in this one train. More wagons mean less lorries on the road too, because this freight train carries the same amount as 70 lorries. Wow! And here's the train, right on time. This is the Tarmac Cross Green Depot in Leeds. The train drives along the tracks and into this shed called the Rail Offload Shed. This is Phil, and he's the rail offloader. He can talk to the driver on this walkie-talkie and ask him to stop or go. Once the first set of wagons are in the shed, Phil can empty the stone out. Hop out, Blue Mechanical, before the stone disappears. Oof! Phil pulls these levers and the doors on the bottom of the wagon open. Wow, that was close, Blue. All of the stone slides out of the bottom, a bit like water going down the plug hole in the bath. The stone falls down below onto another conveyor belt, which carries the stone up and into the tarmac plant, where it can be mixed with other ingredients and turned into concrete or asphalt. That's the stuff that's used to build houses, schools, hospitals and roads. The final step is for big trucks to load up and take the material to building sites ready for construction. I've loved learning all about the important job that freight trains do. Thanks very much to all of the team at Tarmac for letting us tag along. For now, it's Cheerio from Gecko. Bye! Hello everyone, I'm here today at Alton Towers Resort. I'm going to have a ride on some amazing roller coasters and learn all about how they work. Roller coasters are designed for one thing, fun! No two are the same. They can do loops, twists, spins, and can go really, really fast. But how do these amazing roller coasters work? Let's take a closer look. Roller coasters run on tracks like trains, but there's lots of differences too. Trains only have one set of wheels that rest on top of the track. But these cars have three sets of wheels. One on the top, one on the side, and one underneath to grip the track. This means that the roller coaster can do things that trains can't, like going upside down while still staying on the track. But the main difference between trains and roller coasters is how they are powered. Power is what makes everything start just like batteries in a toy helps them turn on. A roller coaster car doesn't have an engine for power, so to get the car moving fast along the track, 
it first needs to be pulled to the top of a very big hill. On this ride called Nemesis, a long chain pulls the car all the way to the top. The car is then released and gravity brings it down the track at whizzing speeds. Gravity is an invisible force that pulls all things down towards the Earth. It's like sliding down a slide. Gravity pulls you downwards. Woo! This ride, Oblivion, works in the same way. The chains slowly pull the car up to the top, which makes the people on the ride very nervous. Wow, look how high that is. This ride is a straight drop, which means there is only one way down. Scary. Some rides don't get pulled up a big hill, but instead are connected to a really long metal rope. When everyone's ready, it's time for launch. The powerful rope is reeled in and pulls really hard on the car. Ready, steady, go, go, go! The rope has launched the car along the track like a huge slingshot. This ride's called Rita and it can accelerate from 0 to 60 miles per hour in just 2.5 seconds. That's as fast as a racing car. When this ride needs to slow down, powerful magnets rise up and use magnetic force to slow down the car. A final set of brakes hold the train in place, bringing the ride to a stop. With all these twists, turns and loops, roller coasters have to be really safe. So all the people who work at Alton Towers work hard to make sure everyone on the ride is secure by loading them onto the ride carefully and checking their seat belts. Clever computers triple check the safety of all passengers too. But roller coasters don't just carry people. At this roller coaster restaurant, it's food and drinks that ride the roller coasters. When the food is ready, they're sent down the track straight to your table. Yum, yum. Well, I think that's quite enough excitement for one day. Thanks to the Alton Towers team for showing us around today. I'll see you next time. Bye! Hello everyone! I'm spending the day with a very special type of car today. A Tesla electric car. This car is very, very fast. We're going to learn lots of amazing things about electric cars today. But first, let's have a look inside. Whoa! Look at those doors! That's one of the coolest things I've ever seen. I think it's worth doing a Gecko Instant Replay on that. Woohoo! These are called Falcon Wing Doors because they look like a bird's wings. And they're designed to open in even really small spaces. Inside the car there's the usual things you'd find. Comfy seats, a steering wheel, pedals, but also this really big screen in the middle which lets you do important stuff like look at the map to see where you're going and play amazing music like toddler fun learning. Listen to the chorus of the Brontosaurus and the Stegosaurus down by Most cars that you see on the road are powered by petrol or diesel, which means they have noisy engines with dirty fumes that come out of the exhaust at the back. Electric cars are completely silent and run on electricity. 
There's no visits to the petrol station for these cars. All you need to do is plug them in and charge the battery inside. It's just like charging a phone. A battery is something that stores energy until it's needed. You'll find batteries in lots of things. I bet there's a lot of batteries in some of your toys. Once the car's plugged in, the screen shows you just how long is left to fully charge. This electric car is a Tesla Model X and it's got a really big battery inside, which is what helps it go really, really fast. This car can get to 0 to 60 miles per hour in just 2.9 seconds. This is what 2.9 seconds feels like. Go! Wow, that was fast! Do you know where a car's engine is usually kept? Yes, it's usually in the bonnet in the front of the car. Let's have a look what's in here. Hold on, look at that. It's empty. There's no engine. Tesla cars have electric motors instead, which are connected to the wheels. The bottom part of a car which is connected to the wheels is called a chassis. This is a chassis without the rest of the car on top. The motor sits here and the big battery sits here. One day we'll all be driving around in electric cars because they're better for the planet. Instead of using dirty fuel which creates pollution, very clever engineers have invented amazing new ways of creating electricity. One of the best ways is to use the power of the sun to charge our electric cars. All across the world there are fields of solar panels which point towards the sky. They convert sunlight into electricity. Solar panels are amazing. You can even put solar panels on your roof at home. Now all of this is really important, but sometimes you just want to see a car do a little dance. And this Tesla has a secret dancing mode, just for fun. I've loved learning all about these amazing electric cars today. Thanks very much to all the team at Tesla for showing us just what they can do. We'll see you again soon. Bye! Hello everyone, Gecko here. I'm back at the Hoylake Lifeboat Station with the RNLI to learn all about their amazing hovercraft. I can't wait to meet the crew and get stuck in. A hovercraft is an amphibious vehicle. Do you know what amphibious means? It means something that can go on land and in the water. This is Chris. He's today's hovercraft commander. Great to see you, Gecko. Coming into our lifeboat station. It's amazing inside this lifeboat station. There's so many huge vehicles that are all designed to rescue people who are in trouble at sea. Gecko, would you like to join us on a hovercraft training exercise? Oh, yes, please, Chris. To stay safe, warm, and dry, the crew have to wear this safety gear. The helmet is actually called a gecko helmet. Can you believe it? It's a real team effort to launch the hovercraft. Push team! The hovercraft is very heavy, so a big tractor is used to tow it safely down to the beach. Then, it 
it's all hands on deck to unclip the hovercraft from the trailer and pump up the inflatable sponsons which help the hovercraft float on water. Then the pilot uses the engine to glide back onto the beach. Hooray! Wow! Look at all of these levers and switches. It all looks very complicated. Nick is the pilot and it's his job to fly the hovercraft. To start the engine, Nick turns this key. We can't see them, but underneath the hovercraft are two fans, which blow air downwards. This fills the skirt with air, making the hovercraft lift off the ground. Wowzers trousers! The big fans at the back are called the thrust propellers, and these push the hovercraft forwards. When Nick moves this lever, the rudders at the back move. It's these rudders that steer the hovercraft left and right. Nick makes the fans move faster and the hovercraft glides forwards. Woo, that is amazing! As commander of the hovercraft, it's Chris's job to check all around and give Nick instructions to help him fly the hovercraft safely. It's so fast and it's so noisy. Now I know why these gecko helmets have microphones and headphones built into them. They allow us to talk and listen to each other. It feels like we're floating across the sand. And just like that, we're on the water. This hovercraft is amazing! Now time for me to hop off and let the crew do their training exercise. The RNLI is a charity set up to save lives at sea. And these training exercises help the team here get ready for real life search and rescue missions. So to be as prepared as they possibly can be, the team practice, practice, practice. Today they're practicing how to rescue someone who is stuck in the mud. Playing in deep mud near the sea can be very dangerous, especially if the tide is coming in. Now that's what I call getting stuck in. Tides are the rise and fall of the levels of the sea. This is something that's happening all of the time, which means that if you're stuck in the mud on the beach, the tide might come in and surround you with water. It's very important to respect the water and make sure you check when the tide is coming in to make sure you're safe when you're at the beach. Well done team, another successful training mission. Oh dear, it looks like the mechanicals haven't checked the tide times and they're stranded on this island. It looks like there's a storm coming too. Luckily, the hovercraft is the perfect rescue vehicle. Jump aboard, mechanicals. the hovercraft is. All that whizzing about in the sand and sea is dirty work. Every time the hovercraft is called into action, the RNLI crew take great care to make sure it's cleaned up and ready to be used again. 
Here in the nice dry lifeboat station is the perfect place for the hovercraft to sleep for the night. Thank you very much to the fabulous crew from RNLI Hoylake for allowing me to spend the day with them and their amazing hovercraft. It's been absolutely brilliant. I'll see you again soon. Bye! Hello everyone! Gecko here! What a lovely day for a walk! But woohoo! This hill's a bit steep! <gasps> Mechanicals! Are you okay? <sighs> I'm struggling a bit too! I should really get out of the garage more and do some exercise! The mechanicals have hitched a lift! How do I get on? Hey! Wait for me! Hi Gecko, are you okay? Welcome to the Great Orange Runway. This is the halfway station. Halfway? You mean I'm not at the top yet? Wow! Now this is the way to travel. Put your feet up and get pulled up the mountain. This is a tram. It runs on rails and it's connected to a really strong cable which pulls it up the hill with absolutely no effort on my part. Phew. Well, hey, We've reached the top! What a view! Up here, there's a cafe, a play area, and even an adventure golf course. Now, this tramway is very old. The Great Orm Tramway was built in 1902. That's over 100 years ago. It was before most people had cars to get around in, and the tramway was used to transport people and their things from the town of Plandidno below, up to the mountain called the Great Orm. Ahem. <coughs> hmm. Let's take a closer look at how these trams work. What do you mean there's no engine? Excuse me, James. If there's no engine in the tram, how does it move up the hill? Good question, Gecko. Well, as you know, the tram is connected to a really strong cable, and this cable is connected to a big winch at the halfway station. Would you like to see? Ooh, yes, please. This is a winch. Wow, this is amazing. This big winch is really strong, and it winds the cable in, which pulls the tram up. But that's not the only help that the tram has. The tram climbing up the hill is also connected to the tram going down the hill. An invisible force called gravity pulls the tram down the hill. Gravity is what keeps us on the ground. Oh dear, Blue. That's gravity for you. It's always pulling us towards the ground, with sometimes painful consequences, eh, Blue? What goes up must come down. Back to the trams. The weight of the tram going downhill helps to pull the other tram up the hill. That means the tram 
doesn't need an engine on board. Wowzers trousers! It takes real teamwork to keep the tram running. The winchman controls how fast and how slow the trams get pulled up and down the hill. But it's the driver on board the tram who gives the winchman the instructions. When the driver presses these buttons on board, a message is sent to the winchman to speed up or slow down the winch. Amazing! Whew! I'm exhausted. All of this learning has made me tired. I might have to leave my big walk until tomorrow. Thanks very much to James and everyone here at the Great Orm Tramway. It's Cheerio from Gecko. Bye!